if you see a picture of a function, you think this as a signal, and usually if the signal comes from a real measurement, then it will live in some sort of shift invariant space. Usually the sh signals are invariant, whether you start here or you start a little bit later, it doesn't matter for the property of belonging to a space. Well, just to uh, show you to which group of people I belong, I use this Fourier transform. Other people use it without the 2 pi. And then the Plancherel formula is different, but up, anything else is the same. And the best example of shift invariant space is the Paley-Wiener space, which is the space of all those functions which are square integrable and whose support of the Fourier transform is in the interval minus one-half, one-half. Well, if you recall the Fourier transform of a function, note that if you, instead of looking at f, you look at the translate of x of f, which is simply x minus y, what will happen when you make the transform? Well, just an exponential comes out, so the support of the function will not change. So this space is what we call translation invariant. This means that if a function is in this space, Translation by any real number is also in that space. For any function in this space. Well, and in fact, this is the star example of uh, the shift invariant spaces because it is the space which, in which we have a real nice theorem which is the, what is called the sampling theorem. It says that any function in this space can be written as a countable sum. So you take the Fourier transform of this function at the integers and multiply it by the exponentials. What do we change from the continuous variable x? We go to the countable numbers f hat of n from which we can extract the whole information of the function. Okay, so this is the great uh, ben benefit of the space. We are still infinite, right? So the real, real advantage is not there because we cannot do infinite sums, right? We can just do finite sums. But in any case, this is what is called the Shannon, Nyquist Shannon Whitaker Kortelnikov theorem. I always like to say the Shannon sampling theorem. And in fact, this is the 100th uh, anniversary of Shannon's birthday. So there are many uh, activities around this. So I thought it was nice to mention it here. And in for this particular space, there is a very deep theorem by, of Wiener, which said that if you have any space, function space or square integral functions, which is translation invariant in the set, sense that I said before, that if you, a function is there, then any translate of this function is there, then the as function space is a space such that the functions that are in there satisfy that they are outside of a measurable set zero. So remember, my original set was that the support of f hat is inside minus one half, one half. From there, we deduced that it, it's translation invariant. Well, the theorem of Wiener says, well, it's not only that way, the other way also holds. Okay, so if it is translation invariant, then we have this. 
Well, let's give an example that is not translation invariant. We take the span closure of the characteristic of zero one. Okay, so this is a, the space of functions that live there essentially are constant on intervals. Well, it is clear that this uh, The only axis that will satisfy that the translate by x of a function who lives there still is in there is if x is in z, because if I translate just by a half, well, the function will not be constant on an interval, right? It's very intuitive. So this is the counterexample of the other space. This one is invariant by integer translates. So it is still a good model for our functions that we want to model, model. But for any other x which is not integer, it is not invariant. And then we go in between. So now I take the space before and I say, well, I want to add a little bit of extra invariance. What means extra? That the functions that live in this space are also invariant by another translation, not only the integers. Well, and the other translation that I introduce here is the translation by one half. Why? Because I add <coughs> this function here, which is, if you recognize it, a shift of the HAR function, and you can prove that the translate of f for any f in S is still in S if and only if x is in one half z. Um, one line of a proof is if you look at the famous multi-resolution analysis construction of Mala, uh, he decomposes the space V1, which is the dilates by two of the first of the functions, then in this space you have on one side the characteristic of zero one and all its translates plus another function because it's a bigger space. And this other function is precisely this guy. I think this is not, okay. And so this is the proof why this is one half invariant. I mean, if it's not clear, it doesn't matter, but you can prove this. So we wanted to know what do we have to require on a space S in order that it is possible to add extra invariance. So what and what, why do we call it extra? Because we are already thinking that we have shift invariance. So we are thinking that we have a space in which the integer shifts are always included. And the extra means additional. And well, we have a characterization. The first surprising fact on the line is that a space cannot be invariant under anything. It's not that you can request, well, is it possible for the space to be invariant under the translates of the interval zero, one half? And no, this is not possible. The elements such that the uh, shift invariant space can be still invariant for it, form a group. And this group contains Z. So either it has a first element or it is the whole, it stands, so it's the whole R. So the only uh, search for having some extra invariance is to find an n such that my space is one over n invariant. Well, obviously, it's, if it's one 
over four invariant, meaning that if you translate by a quarter, then the function is in there. Obviously, it's one half invariant because it's two times one quarter, right? So you are looking for the largest n for which it is invariant. And then you go into your search. Well, let me look. Well, we have this result. And there are certain spaces which are very much used to generalize a little bit the shift invariant case, which are called the Gabor spaces. Gabor, because of the uh, engineer, I believe it was Gabor. I don't recall the first name. And uh, the Gabor space is that in, on top of translates, we also add modulations. So let me write this. I hope I have this. Uh, so I think of a lattice in R times R hat, where R hat is, I think this is the variable in the, of the Fourier transform. And it's obviously the same R. We know that if R and R hat, which is not always the same as some people here know. So you put it because you think of this as a group, and then this R hat is like the dual. And uh, but in this case, gamma lambda is just a lattice in R times R, so it's actually an invertible matrix times Z2. This is what I think of a lattice. And the Gabor space associated to a function phi and the lattice lambda is the span of all the possible actions of this lattice on the function phi. And what are the actions? Well, translate, translation by gamma and modulation by omega. Okay, so I add another element to my space. And again, we are looking what can we say about the invariance of this space under an element which is not in the lattice, right? So this is exactly the, say, the same question as before. So the question that you want to answer in this a little bit more general setting is if there exists an element outside the lambda such that this is still inside my space. Well, in the case of shift invariant uh, spaces, the tool that comes in mind is the Fourier transform. I will show how. Uh, but if you look, well, I wanted to go some the slide before. If you look at the definition of the function, of the action of a element of the lambda on my function phi, if you make the Fourier transform, it's exactly the same, right? We just switch omega with gamma. So in fact, the Fourier transform will give me nothing because the Fourier transform transforms one element into the same just with the, with the elements changed. It's just a calculation. So we have to look for a different tool in order to see what we can say about this. And so there is uh, another tool which is very closely related to the Fourier transform but is more adequate for this space and which is to take the sum of the elements of z and then multiply it with uh, e to the minus 2 pi i k omega. Note that if I sum this function over all elements of z, forget the, then I get a function which is periodic because I have all the elements. And then writing this e to the minus k z is like to get the inverse Fourier transform of a periodic function. 
and the exact transform turns out to be periodic. It does, it's not really important, the form of it, it's just that it helps me to translate my problem from my original function to a function, the exact transform, which seems a little bit easier to handle. Well, uh, I'm switching back and forth of, with this shift invariant case and the Garwar space because the shift invariant space is a little bit more clear to understand, but the philosophy is essentially the same. And so, uh, I want to skip this slide. And I want to say, look at what we gain here. So, when you search for a function that has additional invariance than the shift invariant property, necessarily you lose something. And this is the property which I want to stress in this talk. If you go and remember this, I'm happy. So my function, if I have a function which is square integrable, and I take the space of all translations of this function, all integer translations. Well, if this set turns out to be a re-spaces, well, let's think a basis. Basis, it spans everything and linearly independent in some sense with some additional structure. It's, uh, when you go from finite to infinite, uh, the notion of basis is different, uh, so, the, uh, so a real space is, is the next best to an uh, orthogonal system. And what it's saying here, if my, the, sh the space generated by this is translation invariant, then my function cannot be uh, integral. I mean, it cannot live in L1, so the absolute value cannot be integral. So note that my function was in L2, a hope would be that it is in L1, then the Fourier transform, we all know that it's better to be in L1, so the problem is that if you add uh, things on one side, so you require more things of phi, then you will lose some things somewhere else. And this is exactly what this talk is about. So the theorem these people here show is that if phi is an L2 and is a re-space for its span, if this is translation invariant, then phi is not an L1. And further, uh, it's, they make it's proof a different version of this they say if it's 1 over n invariant, so not translation invariant. Translation invariant was the best you could do. Now, 1 over n invariant, then this uh, integral has to be infinite. So the function may be in L2, but it deca decays very badly. If I take epsilon equal 1, then I have this integral equal to infinity. Well, and this is why the, where the title of my talk comes from, because there is a very famous theorem of Balian and Lowe. They independently proved the same theorem, and both proved it wrong. So both proofs had a gap in it, and it was obviously correct that the proof is true. They had the right idea, but they made a mistake, both in the same place, so you couldn't fix it <laughs> using one and the other. And uh, the, the f uh, philosophy of this theorem is that uh, time frequency concentration 
and non-redundancy are incompatible. Well, this is exactly what I was looking for, right? I wanted extra invariance, so I wanted a function which had allowed more translate of it being in there. Well, but then you lose time frequency concentration. So this is exactly the theorem they have in mind. So this is expressed in this way if you have that the translates times the modulates are a re-spaces, then this product is infinite. This means that one could be finite, but then the other one has to be infinite. And recall from the previous slide that here, oh, I'm missing the bar here, but the, here we have that this needs to be infinite if my phi has extra invariance. And this is what in this uh, next slide is. So we have immediately this theorem here because we have that the since I was assuming that this was a re-spaces, then this had to be infinity. So this is a, a, a theorem, and there is another version of this theorem which is slightly different, different but I think it is adapts better to this talk, and this talks directly about smoothness spaces, and we will call uh, S0 smoothness space of order zero, because there are, of course, SPs and S alpha Ps and whatever you can one find, but we just look at this one. Uh, are those functions of L2 such that they're Short time Fourier lives in L1. What is short time Fourier is instead of integrating everywhere, I multiply with a window function, which is this guy here. And then, so I multiply my f with this window function, so I make it smoother, and I, e to the minus x minus t squared is like this. So I cut off my function up, uh, after some number, and then I calculate the Fourier coefficients, and uh, the smoothness space S0 is those functions who are square integrable and whose Fourier transform, generalized Fourier transform, lives in L1. Well, and then <laughs> the amalgam Balian law says that if I have a function such that these, the translates and the modulates are a re spaces, then the function cannot be in L1. This is essentially the same theorem than we had before, but they are not equivalent. You cannot prove that this one implies the other one or the other one implies this. They are somehow different, but express the same uh, idea that both the balian law theorem and the amalgam balian law theorem are statements about smoothness. And uh, what we were able to do is we could use the second theorem to find, to look at the possibility of my function to have an extra invariance. And this is exactly what I'm heading it. Uh, let's do for simplicity, assume that lambda is a lattice of its z times pz, where p is an n. I think p is bigger than 1. And let me take mu, an element which is u eta, where both u and eta are in q. And my question is, is it possible that the translate by u and the modulate by eta of phi are in this space, which in principle 
only has translations by Z and modulates by ah, PZ, okay? So I start computing, and I don't want to bore you with numbers, but I say, okay, let's assume that this satisfies it. It's inside. But what have happens? If it's inside, then we just compute the Zach transform, the sum, and I have some complicated calculations, but essentially we have exponentials, and I want you to look at these exponentials and the, the function here, just think of it of a, as a function, and when you use that the Zach transform is periodic in the variable x, and whenever you uh, add an integer to the da variable w, it will take out some exponential, then you obtain that the Zach transform of your trans uh, your mod modulated and translated function phi is this, which is a combination, linear combination of exponentials, p is a natural number, and c, k, l are numbers which come out because I was assuming that my function was a re-spaces. So any function in the space has to have a representation. But then I have a function h, which is 1 over p periodic in x. Look, because I have here p multiplying. And 1 periodic in w, OK? Because if I put k plus 1, this doesn't change. And if I put p, uh, 1 over p, plus something, it doesn't change. OK. So my function h satisfies this. And well, looking at this, if I iterate the periodicity of my function h. Remember, p is a number, so I can iterate p times, because after p times, I'm already in the same, have the same function, because my function was 1 over p. And I have u and I have eta, but I, if I iterate this, I get that the product of my h, x plus r u and w plus r eta is equal to this, simply by using the periodicity of my function. So, also by the definition of z of f, it is easy to see that if z of, that if phi is uh, in, uh, L2 in S0, I'm sorry, the smoothness phase, space S0, then Z of phi is continuous. So therefore, if since you remember, of course, that <laughs> Z of phi is equal to this Hx times Z of phi of x omega, so if this function here is continuous, h x of omega has to be continuous. Well, but if it has to be continuous and has to satisfy this, it comes out that necessarily k eta has to be k times p and u has to be in z. I'm not going to bore you with this lemma, but the lemma is actually pretty straightforward if you uh, just think of p equal 2 and the, the integers, because it looks like that when does the 
e to the 2 pi i something is 1, and well, this, this something has to be an integer. And so there, what happens if this happens to be equal, then you need, it will happen that eta has to be k times p and u has to belong to z. Well, so I wanted to find a u eta outside, outside of lambda such that the Zach trans such that P U eta phi was in the space, and I found that the only possibility for this is that eta is KP and U is in Z. So what is the thing that if I have a function phi which is in Z, S0, then I cannot have anything outside. And so this is the moral of this idea, is that if I want to add a smoothness condition on my function, so adding that not only it is square integrable, no, it's also in S0, okay, but then be happy with just having the translates and modulates that you had originally. The function cannot gain anything. Well, so we have the following theorem. If you have a, a function and a lattice, which makes that the translates and modulates of this function are a respaces for its closed span, and the function phi belongs additionally to the smoothness space as zero, well, and I have to say the density of lambda has to be rational, otherwise we cannot do it because our proof relies on this technical lemma that we show that if a function is periodic, then it will repeat itself and so if the density which of the lattice, which is the determinant of the matrix, uh, which the lambda I said was R times Z2, so I can do it if lambda is, the determinant of this matrix is rational. Then this space, then the translates by u and eta cannot be in the Gabor space for any u eta outside. And let me show you in yellow, <laughs> so it is a different theorem, that this is indeed a generalization of the amalgam balian law theorem because there are other tools which tell you that if this is a respaces of L2 of R, you have delta this form, we have alpha times beta equal one, which is in Q. Then if it's a respaces, then we know that if I take any U eta phi, it will be in the Gabor space because this is a respaces for L2 of R. So <laughs> I, I have everything. So translating and modulating is an element of L2 of R, so this guy will be always in my Gabor space because I'm assuming that this is a respaces of L2 of R. So what can I say? Well, my function phi can unfortunately not live in S0. So if I have a function phi that spans the whole L2 of R, the best I can have is that the function is in L2. So I cannot have anything better. And I show you just the, I just want to finish, I think, well, now I have some more things to say and it's since I have time. So it is rel relatively easy to show that there is a 
This continuous function phi such that the translates by a one half of phi are still in the Gabor space in the Gabor space generated by phi and z times three z. Uh, if this phi satisfies that the p lambda times phi is a Ries basis for its span, then if I can find this function which is there, which we can find easily, then it is not a function of S0. So, this is just a way of showing that if my function, if we want our function to satisfy something better, we cannot guarantee the invariance. However, let me just, can we do more? Our, my question is, can we characterize the property that the function phi has to satisfy in order that it admits some extra invariance? The theorem before showed you a property that it cannot satisfy, right? It, if it's an S0, then we have no chance. But can we have something better? Well, and in fact, for shift invariant spaces, we can do it. For Gabor systems, we have an approximation, but we have, there is still a lot more to do. The problem is the lattices in R2 are much, much more complicated than the lattices in R. And let me end with this. Um, theorem that for shift invariant spaces we are able to characterize which functions phi will have extra invariance. So I have a function phi, take all the translates, assume that the translates are a frame. This is I don't need them to be a basis. It's enough that they are generators. A frame is a generator. Then the property that the translates are a frame is equivalent that some cut off of these functions are a frame. And the cut off is in the Fourier side. So I. I want it to be 1 over n invariant. So I take an, an interval of length n in the, so in the real line, I take the interval from 0 n, I split it in n copies of 0, 1, and then I repeat each. So I take the first interval and repeat it n times, I translate it by n, by 2n, by 3n, and so on. So I get the functions which are the Fourier transform is inside these little intervals, not anymore in the 0n. They are in the little intervals. And we have that a function is a shift invariant space. Then the following are equivalent. Uh, S is 1 over N invariant. If F is an S, then FK is the projection of F onto these spaces. UK is an S. So if I cut my function, what I do is actually I cut the Fourier transform of my function into these things. And then I want this to be in, and this is an if and only if. So this is a very satis satisfactory because you can completely characterize the functions. And for the Gavers, 
uh, spaces except the trivial corollary, which is to copy this over to, um, to, to make it in equivalent in R times R, we get a similar characterization, but you could, I believe, we are still working on that, that you can get much more if you have the freedom of um, having a lattice instead of just the translations in R. And that's why I want to stop here. Ah. Thank you very much. And just to mention, uh, I, this was work which we have done with many people uh, during many years, and uh, I wanted to put all the names together. And I will finish with the first slide which I had. Sorry, because I don't know how to do it directly. <laughs> I want to go to the first slide. So I want to end with a, an invitation to everybody because we have been assigned a SIMPA research school next year about harmonic analysis and geometric measure theory and invite everybody to come and join us at this venue in Buenos Aires. So now I leave you for questions. <laughs>